Order. The sitting is now resumed. It is time for question time to the Minister for Social Development. I have to inform the members that questions 10 and 14 have been withdrawn. We will start with listed questions. I call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. A, a range of private sector housing repair, improvement and adaptation grants are available uh, to owner-occupiers. There are seven grants which include two mandatory grants, namely the Disabled Facilities Grant and the Repairs Grant, and then five discretionary grants which are for renovation, replacement, houses and multiple occupancy, uh, home repairs, assistance and common parts grants. One, of the, uh, one main aim of the current grant system is that resources should be targeted at those who can least afford to pay for works to their properties with a particular focus on mandatory grants. The Disabled Facilities and Repairs grants must be paid either on referral by an occupational therapist or on receipt of certain statutory notices. Disabled facility grants are designed to support people with disabilities to live independently in their own homes, and the repairs grant is available to landlords, agents and tenants towards the cost of repairing houses following the issue of statutory notices by the local council. The Housing Executive has the discretion to make available the other grants subject to the availability of sufficient budget. Applications are means tested. This means that the total amount the Housing Executive award for a grant is the total approved cost of the work less the amount the applicant can afford to pay. My department provides other grants to improve the energy efficiency of owner-occupied dwellings. These are the Warm Home Scheme, which is available to households in receipt of certain qualifying benefits. The Affordable Warmth Scheme actively targets low-income households considered to be most at risk of fuel poverty, and the Boiler Replacement Scheme, which assists households with the installation of a new, more energy-efficient boiler. Well, Mr. Elliott, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that information. Does the Minister find that, on occasions, if there are uh, statutory notices uh, put forward, that there may not be the funding, particularly in the repairs grant, which is mandatory, to actually carry out those repairs, or are all those uh, approved? Well, I think that the member, and there's always this issue in relation to having a correlation between the amount of money that you have available and the requirement that, and the duty that's placed upon you. Uh, obviously, uh, there is. Uh, always a challenge for me, and I think also in relation to the housing executive, that uh, they meet their statutory requirements and that they are meeting all their obligations. And the reduction in the discretionary grants has been necessitated by uh, a significant budget reduction since uh, we had, for example, the economic downturn. But I would like to think that we would still be giving priority to those uh, schemes whereby there is a requirement to be applicable uh, and to be uh, found uh, to bring in line the requirement for a statutory order. Call Mr. Ian Mill. Uh, question number two, case number two. Uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, the regeneration of Markerfield Town Centre has been an ongoing commitment of my department since uh, June 2012. DSD has committed funding of £529,493 for a number of regeneration projects which have included the Queen Street revitalisation scheme at £150,000, uh, funding £100,000 for the marketing and branding of Macrofelt and the associated town centre Wi-Fi project which continues to evolve. Uh, a funding contribution of 37,000 for the Gateway Arts feature to be installed at the end of March 2015. Uh, 90,000 pounds to fund the consultancy team uh, to develop the Macrofelt Public Realm scheme, uh, help to detail design stage, and presently funding of 152,493 pound has been provided for the regeneration of the Rainy Street. Uh, with work scheduled to be complete 
on the 31st of March 2015. My, con my department continues to work with the Macrofilt District Council and the new Mid-Ulster Council to deliver as much of the Macrofilt Town Centre Public Realm Scheme before the DSD funding and powers transfer to the new Mid-Ulster Council from the 1st of April 2016. Mr. Millen, first supplementary. Good people ask on Collier. I was Mawakas down there. Good to see Thanks, uh, that Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks for your answer thus far. Uh, could I ask, uh, with the commencement of the new Marafalt bypass, uh, will it have any impact upon your plans you know, for the regeneration of the village or the town? I would hope that that wouldn't be the case. I think that there has been discussions between uh, the those who have been carrying out the work in relation to the master plan and DRD. I think it is important that we ensure uh, we often talk uh, in terms of uh, how government works together and I think it would be uh, a huge uh, challenge if we didn't have a joined up approach in terms of what may be the implications in terms of the, the proposed bypass. So uh, I'm certainly aware of the conversations that have been had uh, between uh, DRD and those who are looking uh, at the master plan so as to ensure that Macrofilt gets the best possible outcome. And I think if you look at uh, what we have outlined in terms of uh, the schemes and the various elements of the schemes, I visited Macrofilt uh, some time ago and I think that uh, it is certainly a very strategic town in Mid Ulster. Uh, and uh, when you see much of the funding that has been allocated, I am very confident that it will continue to enhance and improve uh, uh, Macrofilt in the weeks and months ahead. Well, Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. As part of the master plan, a a, which was commissioned back in 2011. A strategic a target was outlined that vacant units would be occupied in the town centre will have further established itself as a lively leisure hub with a thriving evening economy. Would the minister advise how the DSD regeneration function will work in partnership with the, local, the new local council who will shortly have responsibility for planning? Well, I think that's, again, another important element of all of this is making sure that that actually does happen. Uh, the member will be aware that the, the issue of area plans and community planning becomes an integral part of what will be the new regime as of the 1st of, of April. And I'm keen and indeed have uh, asked for a meeting with the Environment Minister to further discuss these issues because I think that it's just not enough for us as ministers to believe that uh, what may be in a piece of paper in a particular master plan or a particular scheme will ultimately always come in to fruition. Uh, and that is why the partnership panel, uh, which I, along with my other ministerial colleagues, uh, sit on, uh, which is the, the coming together of the local authorities and central government to discuss these very issues. Uh, and I would like to think that when it comes to how we uh, roll out the schemes, we roll out these plans, that we do it in a way that is in conjunction with the councils, and the member may be aware that uh, I plan to meet, uh, have already commenced the process of meeting with the new councils, uh, so that it is a partnership rather than an imposition of uh, how we move forward in the future. I'm very determined to ensure that from my part and from the department that I'm responsible for and the responsibilities that we have, that we work with councils, not against them, and that would include as a strategic level, that would include how we ensure the delivery of master plans and all the relevant schemes that are currently in the system. Colleen McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I welcome the, the Minister's commitment to Macrofelt by providing the funding of, I think he said, £152,493 for the Rooney Street project? Um, but certainly the work is ongoing and, and um, already we're seeing the benefits. But can the Minister, um, al alongside that funding, can he advise the House what pr um, amount of money will be provided to the new mid Ulster Council when the, the funding package is provided to councils? I, I thank the, the member for uh, his supplementary and I think it, well, it might be useful uh, also to outline for the member is uh, the, in, in terms of 
the town centre in Macrofilt, uh, really the benefit that it has, and you've made reference to Rainy Street, the new Mid Ulster Council has indicated that it's committed to delivering three new public realm schemes in Macrofilt, uh, Cookstown and in Gannon, phase two, uh, at an estimated cost of uh, over £8 million. Uh, the Mid Ulster Council has assessed that it can deliver uh, 4.5 million of these works in the 15-16 financial year subject to DSD providing this level of funding. And all government departments, including DSD, have had to take, uh, as you know, difficult decisions on how to allocate the reduced resources. But I have just today signed off uh, letters to all the 11 councils, uh, which outlines to them uh, what will be their funding allocations. Uh, and uh, I'll be putting that. I've also sent a copy of it to the Minister for the Environment, and I will ensure that a copy of that is placed in the library so that members will be able to see. Uh, I would ask that that won't probably happen until the end of this week, until councils have had the opportunity to see first in terms of the allocation that has been made. This has been a, a difficult uh, budget reprocess, and I've, uh, members have heard me say this before. Uh, in that uh, it has been a huge challenge uh, when you have to uh, ensure that you are trying to meet all your uh, demands as a department. And then we have the issue in relation to how we would continue to fund local government. And I think it was very important that we did not send out to local authorities uh, any indication that somehow we felt that they were not worthy of being given the support that they deserve. Someone who came from local government to this House, I'm very uh, supportive of our local councils. I wish the new councils well uh, in their, the commencement of their work on the 1st of April. Uh, but I think it was vitally important that in terms of the budget... I to bring his remarks to a close. Yes. Thank you, Mr Deputy <laughs> Principal Speaker. While it won't be as they expected, I don't think it will be as adverse as they thought it possibly would be initially. Mr. Patsy McGlow. I got a free last year on colleagues. We have Slashan Ira Aston Regra Kimshika. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his wide ranging uh, answer there. Uh, just in regard of, and you've, you've taken us there, Minister, in regard to the diminution uh, funding that you have by way of streams for urban development, what facility or resource exists at your department for helping potential developers or uh, councillors of the likes? Um, in identifying other funding streams, be they EU or private access funding schemes? I uh, thank the member for, for that question. And I think that one of the, the challenges that we had, and, and I also discussed this uh, with uh, his colleague, the Minister for the Environment, because you'll, you'll be aware that uh, his budget was under particular pressure in relation to elements, environmental elements of his budget. Uh, previously, <coughs> under my department, we had the Urban Regeneration Grant. Uh, prior to me coming in to, to post that, uh, uh, funding stream had uh, come to a, an end. In fact, well, we're now just in the, the end process of that. And I have given serious consideration to uh, what we potentially could do uh, in terms of bringing back something similar to uh, an urban regeneration grant. And I'll, I'll give the, the member uh, the, the rationale for that. I think if you look at a number of our towns across Northern Ireland, uh, especially some of the towns uh, that have benefited from urban regeneration grants, they became the catalyst for other investment. And so they weren't the sole funder of a particular project. And I can think of one in my own town uh, in uh, Main Street in Ballymoney. Uh, and it had not been for the urban regeneration grant, if it had not been for money that came from DOE, then that would not have incentivised the owner of the property to be able to proceed because one of the challenges that he had in relation to proceeding was that it was in a conservation area and obviously that brought its own additional costs. But if anyone visits uh, the premier town of Ballymoney uh, uh, in the, the, and I say, I say that without any prejudice uh, and I say it with a straight face, uh, you, you will see how that a building how a building has been transformed, and in transforming a building, I believe we have transformed 
the town centre and the main street. So I am looking at the minute as to what potentially could be done in relation to that, but given the budgetary constraints, it will be a challenge for us. Well, Mr. John Dallet. Question number three. My department is helping facilitate the move by Ulster University from Jordanstown to Belfast, uh, primarily through its role in the Strategic Advisory Forum. Uh, my department leads and coordinates the Strategic Forum, a cross-departmental high-level body which considers a range of strategic issues including planning and public realm, transportation and car parking, student housing, skills, employment and business outreach as well as community engagement. The Strategic uh, Advisory Forum has been instrumental in supporting the progress of the new campus which is in construction phase and is on schedule to open in 2018. Among the examples of this are the successful outcome of the decision to award planning permission for the Frederick Street car park which was pivotal to the university's move to Belfast, supporting the introduction of social clauses in construction contracts and collaboration and advice on engaging with businesses, communities and neighbourhoods in the immediate vicinity of the new campus. Significantly, my department has also uh, adjusted its Belfast Streets Ahead programme, bringing forward phase three so that the, this major public realm investment of around £35 million can complement and support the development of the university's new campus. Mr. Dallet, for a supplementary. Well, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive answer. Uh, could the Minister give us his assessment of the impact this move may have on social housing? And I'm thinking not just about the students, but the increasing number of young people who are dependent on the Simon community and other organisations for a roof over their head. Yeah, thank the member for the supplementary. And I, I've had a concern. Uh, I, I've had a concern, and, and I'll outline it uh, in this way. Uh, the member will also be aware of the proposal in relation to Northside and the concerns that have been expressed uh, by local communities there as to the impact that that would have, and that somehow what we would basically what we would basically do by this move is that we would create another uh, challenge to a local community from. Uh, student accommodation and create another holy land. And I am very aware of those concerns, uh, but I do believe that it is better to have an agreed plan as to have the situation that we currently have, which is basically permission has already been given for a number of developments and they're very sporadic and there's no control and there's no central control of how that will all be managed. I have another concern. Uh, and I, I take the point that he makes in relation to the Simon community. I'm very uh, conscious of, of those concerns and that we don't do anything that exacerbates that situation. But the other concern I have, and I think it would only be right uh, to say this to the House, is that I do believe that there needs to be a greater coordination between all the departments in relation to this. We have the strategic forum, but I don't believe that that forum has got the buy-in from everybody at a uh, high enough level because we have DOE issues, we have DARD issues, we have Department of Justice issues, we have Dell issues, we have DSD issues. And let's remember this is coming. So this campus is coming and progress is being made. And so to try and uh, take all of that into account, I have now asked my ministerial colleagues if they will come together and have a further discussion as to strategically how we are going to ensure that one of the largest investments in Belfast over many years, over a billion pounds worth of investment in that part of our city, I think has to be coordinated, has to be planned, so that we deliver the best possible outcome for everybody that's involved. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the Minister, as a, as a representative of North Belfast, um, for his answer so far. But can I ask the Minister what exactly has the Strategic Advisory Forum, forum achieved? Uh, I thank the, the, the member for uh, her, her question. And I think that it would be fair to say that the, the forum has representation, at, as I've said, at a high level from across government and, and I think is, is therefore able to s at least supply uh, solutions as problems arise over the uh, period of uh, this particular scheme. 
and an example is where the Strategic Advisory Forum was instrumental in securing the successful outcome of the decision to award planning uh, for the permission for the Frederick Street car park, which, if it hadn't been secured, I think we would be in a completely different uh, situation in terms of, of this particular issue. And as a condition of the university's planning permission, the university had to acquire a car park with 350 spaces within 400 metres of the university's main building. And following analysis of the local car parks, the Frederick Street site was identified as the only viable option in terms <coughs> of regeneration of the area and meeting the university's car parking requirements. And my department and DRD were able to assist the university in acquiring the car park. So I think that that gives a, an example one example of what could be done, but I still go back to the concern that I have in terms of the momentum, uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, that this particular forum is having, uh, and that is why I have initiated, following on from discussions with the university, following on from discussions uh, with the council, because let's remember uh, Belfast City Council plays a hugely important role uh, in this issue as well, and I want to make sure that everybody, government, council and the university, are engaged in a way that delivers the best possible project. Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for the information that you've given the House so far on the University of Ulster's project at uh, York Street. But can the Minister tell us what action he has taken with the University to ensure that this important development includes a genuine opportunity for shared space in that part of North Belfast? And on his cross-cutting issues, what action has he taken with the Regional Development Minister to encourage the York Gate interchange? Well, if I could deal with the, 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 the last uh, part first. I think the member does make uh, a very important uh, reference to the interchange because uh, if we are to transform uh, that particular part of, of the city, uh, one of the elements in which it will be pivotal uh, is the transport infrastructure. Uh, for example, we need to be uh, sure that the uh, railway connection uh, in terms of York Street uh, is tied into as part of, and uh, I would have a concern that at this minute in time that, that strategic thinking as to how, uh, if, if we were to encourage, as we have seen a phenomenal growth in the railway, and if we were to encourage those students who are, are very are good at using the railway system uh, so that they have access to the university, surely a key component part of it is the location of where York Street uh, would be. I've, that's the reason why I have asked for a meeting with the other ministers because I do worry, and I have this concern, uh, that there is almost a, a sense of, well, we know this is happening in, in 18, this is coming, but it's not as organised and strategic as I think it should be. On the, the first point in relation to uh, the, the shared provision, I think the very nature of the university uh, is of a shared uh, campus. It uh, is not a campus which is for any particular section of the community. So I think they, in and of themselves, have the essence of what a shared provision is. And I think that they will bring that experience that they've already had in terms of how they deliver in Jordanstown uh, to this part of Belfast. Call Mrs. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, question four, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, my department has invested approximately uh, 3.2 million in public realm works in Lisbon since uh, April 2011. Uh, this investment, which includes new granite paving, new street furniture, enhanced lighting, street planting, a spectac spectacular event uh, place, and resurfacing works, which uh, will result in significant improvements to the main thoroughfares of Market Square, Market Street, Bow Street, Market Lane, Graham Gardens and Haslam's Lane. The aims of the scheme are to substantially raise the quality of the environment to enable Lisburn uh, City Centre uh, to diversify and create modern office accommodation to attract businesses and leisure activities that will help to sustain activity in the city centre outside traditional business hours. This investment in Lisburn City Centre is considered to be fundamental to delivering the economic regeneration of the city to ensure it remains vital and viable for the years to come. Mrs. Hale for a supplementary. 
I thank the Minister for his answer, and Lisbon welcomes the investment that's went into it. So what impact does the Minister expect that this investment will have on the city centre when it is eventually completed, and what are the expected outcomes for this scheme? Well, I, I think, again, as we've said, even in relation to other schemes, uh, whether you look at the scheme uh, in Macrofilton or in other places, I think they play an, an important role. And if we hadn't been making that investment in our towns, we would have seen, I believe, a, a, far, a far worse situation. Let's remember many uh, town centres right across the United Kingdom uh, are uh, in dire condition. And I think that when we come to some of our own towns, the investment that we have made has made a substantial improvement. And I think it's an, an improvement in this, in this way. It's designed to rejuvenate. And let's remember, Lisbon has a very historic history. It's a very historic uh, city. And I think that this uh, in investment uh, will ensure that high quality public realm schemes provide uh, a better platform for investment uh, in the city. And I think that uh, it's al always challenging. And I know that you know, there are public realm schemes uh, that uh, there are particular issues raised about and there are always particular problems and, and, and difficulties. But I think that where we have worked our way through those problems, where we have worked our way through those difficulties, we have also seen a benefit. The measurable objectives of the scheme is to enhance the retail expenditure by 10%, uh, to reduce vacancy rates by 15%, increase, increase levels of footfall by 10% and increase city centre living uh, in the project area. And an evaluation of the completed scheme will be carried out a year after the completion to the measures and the outcomes and the objectives. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy uh, Principal Speaker. The transfer of urban regeneration powers and responsibility to councils has been uh, deferred for one year until April uh, 2016, as members know. This means that my department will continue to be responsible for administering urban regeneration and community development in 2015 uh, uh, 16. Neighbourhood renewal provides services to people living in our most deprived communities. In this difficult financial climate, I'm seeking to protect those projects which demonstrate most effectively that they are meeting the objectives of the programme, the process of assessing applications on the basis of evidence and the need and impact of each project is currently ongoing. Well, Mr Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his uh, answers thus far. I um, could also thank the Minister for coming out to Lord Nars Road um, uh, this past few months. And could he give us an update on the refurbishment of the Ballymac Centre? I'd like to thank the, the member for uh, the invitation to uh, go and visit the Lower Newton Arch Road, and I was delighted uh, to be able uh, to do that visit, to see firsthand. And of course, this is always the part of the, the job that I enjoy the most. Uh, there's other parts I can assure you are not as just as enjoyable uh, and uh, are more challenging and demanding. But to be able to go out and well. to see firsthand the impact and the benefit that an announcement even of funding could be. And, and we're currently going through the process to appoint the contractor as part of the process. And uh, a short list of contractors will be compiled and invited to submit bids for the project. And I was able to uh, uh, give the assurance to the local community, uh, along with yourself and, uh, and Gavin Robinson on, on that occasion, uh, and to the local community and their representatives that uh, the money had been secured. And I think that when you look at the raft of organisations that use the Ballymac Centre and the uh, huge impact that they can have in their local community, I was delighted to be part of that announcement and I look forward to going back to the Lower Newton Arge Road when the facility will be officially opened. Well, Mr Mickey Brady. Cora, I got the pre last Concordia. Could I ask the Minister to outline if and how his department will continue to engage with local government following the transfer of neighbourhood renewal policy and funding. Yeah, and, I, and I thank the member for that question because I think it, it is important that it's not just a case of uh, I can't wait until we get to uh, April 16 until we transfer the powers, transfer the functions, transfer the money, and then it's a case of, well, we'll see you sometime in the future. I continue 
uh, and would like to ensure that there will be uh, the continual working between the local councils and central government through my department to ensure that we collectively are there to address the issues because this will be a learning uh, issue for local authorities and uh, the member may have heard me say earlier that's why I've, I've uh, set about a process now of meeting each of the local authorities to discuss their budget discuss their priorities and how we will continue to work in the future. And also another part of that is the partnership panel which has been a, a, a set up because I believe that's also important so that local government has the confidence that central government is there to help support and to be there so that whatever the issues are, we can collectively get a solution to those problems. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions and I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, if I could ask the Minister, given the uh, extraordinary uh, political gymnastics performed by Sinn Féin over the past uh, number of days, uh, it was in fact suggested that uh, the Minister had met with Sinn Féin during the course of last week. During the course of those meetings, were any concerns expressed by Sinn Féin in relation to welfare reform? I uh, thank the, the member for the question. And I think to say that we were shocked uh, would be putting it mildly. Uh, what happened uh, in this house, uh, in this building yesterday, uh, was monumental in terms of the future of these institutions because it was clear from what happened yesterday that I think there are other agendas that are at work. I don't think that they're all down to the issue of concerns about welfare. Yeah. Let me place on record that I did meet uh, with Sinn Féin last Thursday after the executive meeting when concerns have been expressed. Those concerns in terms of how we implement the Storm and Castle Agreement have been going on over a period of time. Because let's remember that we had an agreement, or we thought we had an agreement, a five-party agreement, which set out the terms and the conditions and the, the money, the funding, for how we would move forward in relation to welfare reform. As part of that, we also said that we would bring together and we would ensure that this House, and when I brought all of these issues to the House through the consideration stage and the further consideration stage, we underline, underlined the importance of the regulations. We underlined the importance of the schemes that would introduce the supplementary payment fund, that would introduce the other four schemes. One of those schemes was actually approved at the Executive on Thursday the scheme in relation to universal credit. And I have given my commitment, and it's on public record, uh, on a number of times. I remind the member of the two-minute rule. That I will work with those who have issues of concern and that they would be brought to this House. The meeting did take place and concerns were expressed. The member listed at question number topic. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very detailed response. Uh, but during the course of that meeting on Thursday, uh, was, there, uh, was there a point at that meeting where the Sinn Féin representatives expressed the view that there was a red line in relation to the supplementary payments uh, which they could not uh, go over, and that they would, in fact, uh, reject uh, the uh, welfare reform bill. Uh, I have to say that I got no indication that there was going to be a bombshell drop right. on Monday, and it was then left that we would give further consideration to what would be needed in terms of clarification around and my officials, and I want to say this, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, 
I am extremely disappointed at the comments that have been made in relation to my officials, that somehow there has been a dispersion cast on officials in my department, that they somehow misled people, that they somehow gave dud information. I stand by my officials. I stand by their integrity. I stand by their impartiality because they were asked prior to Christmas to do a huge amount of work in very challenging and difficult circumstances. And I want to say that it is extremely disappointing. I am big enough and have big enough shoulders. I'm a politician and I can take criticism and I can take all that that brings. <laughs> but what I will not tolerate is that there are those people who have gone on to the public airways in recent days and they have found it uh, their aim and object to give uh, crit criticism to my uh, officials. But it, in terms of how we were asked to progress on Thursday, it was so that we would get further information on how much it would cost to have existing and future claimants in relation to the supplementary payment fund. That was the information that we have now subsequently uh, uh, gained. And I would say that the only comment that was made was that one, Minister and I think this is important, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, one comment was made, and I'm not attributed to any one individual because I think that's unfair, but that we were against the wire. I still don't know what wire that was. I know the wire that Republicans have been against in the past, and it normally was in a prison uh, context. But I have to say, I was not made aware of any wire. Maybe it was the issue of their conference at the weekend, but that's an issue for others to answer, uh, not about. an issue for me. On their name. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers. Following on from yesterday's shock announcement, Sinn Féin have questioned the credibility of the figures provided, by, provided to all five party leaders during the Stormont Castle discussions before Christmas by officials. Does the Minister wish to give us any assurance on these figures at this time? Yes, and I, and I thank the member uh, for giving us the opportunity to do this. And I've already made uh, reference to that uh, in my answer to uh, the question posed by uh, Mr. McGuinness. For clarification, um, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want people, I want this, this will be recorded, but I not only want people to hear it, I want people to really listen to what we're going to say. So for clarification, any figures provided were not provided by the DUP, but by senior DSD officials. Officials who are totally impartial and independent and have no political axe to grind. The figures which were worked up by senior officials were given to both Sinn Féin and the DUP at the same time. The same figures were then given to the leaders of the five parties, which was followed by a discussion with the five party leaders, senior DSD officials and the head of the civil service when the figures were explained. And I cannot allow this to pass without making comment about the integrity and the service provided by my senior officials during the Stormont Castle discussions. These officials went beyond the call of duty in the time that they gave to this issue. And I will not stand by and watch uh, Sinn Féin uh, in terms of what they have said, uh, save their own blushes and the incompetence that they have displayed in relation to this issue, trying to pass the blame on to others. Mr. Dunn, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. As a DUP DSD minister, does the minister uh, continue and stand determined to work to find a solution to resolve the matters and to move Northern Ireland forward? Uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, when I came into office, uh, it was abundantly clear that there was a problem and there were, uh, there were issues in relation to welfare. I challenged the members opposite. I both challenged the chair 
of the DSD committee and his party to prove at any stage where I have been dishonourable, where I have been dishonest, where I have at any stage ever tried to mislead anyone in relation to the issue of welfare. Now, this is not about my integrity, but it is about the future of people in Northern Ireland that we are dealing with. What we saw yesterday was shameful. What we saw yesterday was disgraceful. And I will continue to work whatever needs to be done to ensure that we, to the letter of the law and to the very figures within the Stormont Castle Agreement, we implemented every line, every dot, every figure that's in that agreement. That's what the five parties signed up to, and it's time that Sinn Féin recognised that. I would also say this. I would call upon them today to apologise to my officials for the disgraceful comments that have been made and the slur that has been cast upon my officials in relation to this process. I call Ms Megan Farron. Um, asking, Gorla, can I ask the Minister to um, outline how his strategy and repossessions will unfold and if it will allow assistance for people to stay in their homes? Well, the member will be aware in terms of the repossession task force and, and I am keen to ensure that what is a very difficult and a very challenging issue and, and no one can underestimate other than those who have gone through the trauma and the difficulties uh, that there is a need for us to do everything we possibly can to help and assist those who are found in that position. And the repossession task force, I think, has set out for us a number of recommendations, some that we will want to move forward quickly on, and others that I think will take some time to work through the system. Well, Ms. Farron, for supplementary. Gourmet, I thank the Minister for his answer. So far, um, the Minister alluded to the hugely traumatic impact that could have on a family or, or a person losing their homes. Um, and obviously, there's a huge cost in not just financial terms, but also in human suffering. Um, and has the Minister considered a mortgage to rent scheme to allow people to stay in their homes? I think that what we shouldn't uh, do is that we shouldn't rule out what is potentially possible. And I have also raised concerns about where. Uh, this all sits in relation to the banks, and so uh, every possible uh, avenue, every possible scheme that I think would bring benefit to addressing this problem needs to be considered uh, as we move forward. Call Mr. Jerry Kelly. Um, could I ask the, the Minister, I, I've listened to him uh, over his last uh, few comments, that in fact Sinn Féin was not blaming the officials, but in fairness, uh, we have blamed the DUP, and I'm glad that the Minister is taking responsibility uh, for the position uh, as head of that department. Um, would he accept that on numerous occasions that uh, members of uh, Sinn Féin publicly, and indeed to your own party, uh, said that the intention and the agreement in, uh, in Stormont uh, House was to make sure that uh, those on benefits under the jurisdiction of the uh, Assembly and the Executive uh, would not be worse off after the signing of the, uh, the agreement. Uh, I have to say, uh, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, there has been a, a fixated excitement by Sinn Féin over the last couple of days to troll through everything that has been said. And they haven't been able to find anything of substance that this minister has said in relation to the implementation of the deal. Now, well, what, we can, what we can give to the House is what the chair of the DSD committee said. Yes. Now, what did he say? Sinn Féin chair. For the record, no one in Sinn Féin, and this was in this House on Tuesday the 24th of February, in relation to the Welfare Reform Bill, for the record, no one in Sinn Féin ever said that no one would ever lose out as a result of the welfare reform. Oh, oh dear. Now, if members opposite are going to do as they have always done and be partial and pick out elements of what has been said and then try and misinterpret it, then I think it is time. If it is within the capabilities of the organisation that is known as Sinn Féin to be truthful, and we'll see tonight, uh, following on from the Spotlight programme, 
really how truthful they really can be. Let us then deal with the issue which is at hand. Does Sinn Féin really know what they signed up to at the Stormont Castle Agreement? Well, Mr. Kelly for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his, uh, his answer up to now. And since he is talking about truth and since he is quoting from other people, then would he agree to the quote uh, from himself where he said, I think it's on the 12th of January, I think that we need to build on the achievements of the Stormont House Agreement. There is a huge amount of work. I have given an undertaking to the Assembly in relation to the information that we will bring to the Assembly in terms of the guidance notes and how the bill will make its passage through the House. That will be subject to a paper that I trust I will be able to bring to the executive shortly so that we can progress the issue. Ask the member to come to this question. And, well, I have asked the question with respect. I am quoting this and I want to, to the ask does the, minister, does the minister stand over it? If I could finish. If, if I could finish. Uh, and it says, uh, I'm not challenging the chair, I'm really pointing out that I've, I'm asking a question. I'll, okay. I'll ask, I'll ask a member okay. to take a seat. So I'll I trust I'll I will ask, be able I'll to bring to the executive shortly. I'll, so I'll ask a member to take a seat. Bond. Well, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, if I knew, if I knew what the question no was. Point of order. No uh, point of order. Come on. Uh, I think it is, despite all that Sinn Féin has tried to do, in the last 24 hours. It is abundantly clear and plain to all those that want to see that this is not about welfare reform. This is about some other political agenda that they have. But I can let them know they will not use me or my party to unpick, to undo what we agreed on the date in terms of the Stormont House Agreement. We stand by every letter, we stand by every figure, the five parties agreed to. That's what I will faithfully implement as a minister responsible for welfare in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Order. We must move to questions to the